So I'll, I'll just get started. I know um, <clears throat> uh, Matt wouldn't want to uh, rest on formalities. If, if you need to get something extra to drink or to eat while this is happening, please feel free. Uh, 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 we're here to remember a wonderful guy and the things he wrote, and I know it would make him happiest if we were just all ourselves. Uh, I'm Ted Conover, and I thank everybody for coming on this very rainy evening. I, uh, I think if we read long enough, the rain may stop. That's, that's my theory. Uh, we remember Matt Power <clears throat> through his stories, uh, the ones he wrote and the ones he told us after he came back from his journeys. I imagine you'll hear both kinds of stories tonight from friends and from fellow writers and editors, almost all of whom seem to become his friends after working with him. I met Matt in my workshop at the Breadloaf Writers Conference uh, where he was overqualified. His manuscript submission was a piece he'd already published in The Believer about a community of supposedly lost Jews in India. But he didn't hold that above any of the other aspiring writers there. I hung out some with Matt and Jess in New York after that and began inviting him to my class here at NYU every spring. I think it was last year, the shirt he wore, uh, this polo shirt, had holes in it um, uh, from standing too close to a fireworks display in Mexico. Uh, am I, if I got this right, there was a button missing and he had some whiskers charred. Um, I think a lot of us here have stories like that about Matt and along with the snippets of his articles that you'll hear tonight, uh, you may hear uh, a few recollections like that. Anyway, I would assign a piece by Matt and he would come and discuss it and discuss the freelance life and how his uh, intention of getting, getting an MFA at Columbia uh, got derailed and how he turned to nonfiction first working as a fact checker and, and increasingly as a freelance writer. He'd tell my students how to pitch with suggestions for avoiding the slush pile, which he himself had sorted through at at least a couple of jobs. I wrote down this quote from him a couple years ago. The marketplace for ideas is huge, he told students more than once, but behind it is a massive garbage dump. He always left them with his email address and an invitation to write him, and they were always grateful. And I think at least a couple of those students are here tonight. Uh, as I said, we'll focus on Matt's work tonight, uh, brief excerpts from several pieces uh, arranged in roughly chronological order, which you can, uh, you can follow here. Don't worry, we're not reading all of these 8,000 eight word pieces. We're just reading uh, little pieces of them. Mostly uh, the readers had some connection to the work and, uh, and, and, and Matt will be with us that way. Um, our first reader will be Roger Hodge and I'd ask those who follow Roger to please introduce themselves. Thanks, Ted. I'm gonna read from the Poison Stream, which was the first piece that Matt and I worked on together at Harper's. It was published in 2004. Uh, he was living in India at the time in Delhi. And as I recall, I've lost all my email from that period, but as I recall, um, I think he just pitched it to me over the phone. And uh, we went through a couple of drafts just working on structure mostly and, and tone. And this is, this is the opening. The months leading up to the monsoon in Kerala are drawn out, hot and dusty. Thirst seems to become the base condition of all living things. Menace permeates casual interactions. The bartering session for an auto rickshaw or a bag of tomatoes is dreaded, seething. Stray dogs, their distended udders slack lie as if melted next to their unconscious litters. The puppies too hot even to touch one another. Whole villages retract into the vast circles of shade cast by the absurdly pink blossomed acacia trees. 
and young coconuts hacked open with sickles and drained of milk pile up like the severed heads of a vanquished army outside the chai stalls. It is to this season that I arrive in Kasargad, the northernmost city of India's southwesternmost state. It was a 48-hour journey south from Delhi through half a dozen climactic zones and a hundred languages. An old Muslim man prostrate across the aisle sent evening prayers west toward Mecca. By the grass shacks of Uttar Pradesh, handmade dung cakes were stacked in geometric perfection, drying for fuel. In the Rajasthani desert, children brought lines of cattle home along dusty roads, and women head-balanced water pots as bright saris billowed behind them their camels laden with watermelons. Everywhere, games of cricket were improvised. An old tire for a wicker, wicket, a ball made of scrap cloth hit with a bat pried from a fence. From the open door of the train, I had seen the vast juggies that grew from the cities like cancer cells. Jerry-built shacks of hammered flat oil barrels, tattered plastic tarps, salvaged mud bricks and liberated billboards advertising thumbs up or fair and lovely, which occupied every available inch of space for miles along the tracks. On the station platforms, mothers with full-blown aids reach through the bars of the second-class carriages begging alms. Old men squat, shitting by the tracks as the train rackets by. Children salvage scrap aluminum and plastic mineral water bottles from rivers of sewage. Here were formerly rural people who had fallen beneath the, wind, the wheels of economic progress, shut out from the shining India promised them in the government's advertisements. They had fled a host of plagues to come to the cities where at least they would not starve. The Kasargad station platform greets me like a blast furnace. A goat walking along between tracks stoops to eat a banana peel from a stream of raw sewage. A cow splattered with the hot pink dye that celebrates Holi, the Hindu festival of spring, stands nearby and slowly chews a cardboard box. The English papers on the newsstand are full of weird, violent tales. Opposition rioters in the state capital have firebombed 12 government vehicles. An entire family of elephants have been hit by a train and are to be cremated on the spot using a crude napalm of gasoline and sugar. Five people were killed after drinking bootleg palm liquor spiked with pesticide. Five years of drought are followed by killing floods. Fifty perish in a bus mishap in a country that often seems constructed out of bizarre occurrences and unimaginable sorrows. It is difficult to shock the conscience. Many stories slip through the cracks. If I had happened to pick up a paper here in 1982, Perhaps I would have come across the strange story which ultimately led to my journey 20 years later, calves born with warped limbs. I have come 1,500 miles from Delhi to visit the tiny remote hill village of Vaninagar, a place that has been devastated by a spate of mysterious illnesses over the last two decades. Rare cancers, birth defects, mental retardation, miscarriages, suicides, Babies that were carried to term were sometimes born blind or epileptic or with deformed limbs. Children shriveled and died from leukemia, and old women were covered with lesions that would not heal. In a culture bound by notions of karmic retribution, people naturally assumed it was a curse, that they had angered their guardian spirits. At the station, I met by my, fri met by my friend Vinod, a journalist and native Carolite, who has agreed to serve as a translator and guide into the hill country east of here. We negotiate a driver and an ambassador car. On the dashboard is a plastic shrine to Kali Ma, the black goddess, tongue stuck out, wearing a necklace of severed heads. When the brakes are applied, her eyes light up red. I watch out the window as we wind up into the hills, the temperature easing slightly from the oppressiveness of the narrow coastal plain. The parched red earth along the roadside shows the warp of the last monsoon, weathered and smooth as scar tissue. We pass through plantations of tall, thin areca palms from which the dark red betel nut chewed in the mildly narcotic pond is harvested. To harvest areca, the 
pickers will bind their feet with a loop of cloth called a thorth, pressing their soles against the slim trunk as they inch warm 40 feet into the air. They keep a sprague of thulasi, a sacred native medicinal plant pressed behind their ears to maintain balance. Having cut all the areca from a given tree, they shift their weight and bend the entire palm over until they can grab onto the next one, working their way down the rows without returning to earth. I get my first glimpse of a ripe, lipstick red bunch of cashews hanging directly over the road, the gray seed pods hanging disembodied like question marks below the bulging, vaguely obscene fruit. An old woman stooped below a huge load of firewood stops without straightening or looking as we pass. Glancing back, I see her head tilt to the side and a blood red gout of pond spit arcs into the red dust. We pull up to the low tree shaded, tree -shaded house of Sri Padre, a local farmer and activist. He was one of the first to bring attention to the strange illnesses in the district. As we walk up to the shade of the porch, the stout, mustachioed padre comes outside and extends his hand. I got your message, he says, smiling. I was hoping you wouldn't come. standing on my tiptoes. So that piece um, is how I met Matt Power. My name is Maria Headley. He was at Bread Loaf when I met him, and he was um, holding the issue of Harper's in which the poison stream had just come out in and was, was desperate for someone to read it. <laughs> um, he had a gin and tonic in one hand for me and the issue in the other hand, and he was just ready for me to to stop everything I was doing and read that, but I had read it on the plane to Breadloaf, so I was very lucky. The piece I'm going to read from is uh, The Magic Mountain, which came out in 2006, also in Harper's, and uh, Roger and I were just laughing because I was one of Matt's um, emergency friend editors, and I edited the first draft of this piece before Roger got it. So now I've done another edit. I've kind of, um, I've, uh, I've fucked with it. I'm reading a chunk probably about a thousand words of this, but it's from all over the essay. One of my favorite things he ever wrote. Coming over a rise, my first glimpse of Peatus is hallucinatory, a great smoky gray mass that towers above the trees and shanties creeping up to its edge. On the rounded summit, almost the same color as the thunderheads that mass over the city in the afternoon, a tiny backhoe crawls along a contour, seeming to float in the sky. As we approach, shapes and colors emerge out of the gray. What at first seems to be flocks of seagulls spiraling upward in a hot wind reveal themselves to be cyclones of plastic bags. The huge hill itself appears to shimmer in the heat, and then its surface resolves into a moving mass of people, hundreds of them, scuttling like termites over a mound. From this distance, with the wind blowing the other way, Peatus displays a terrible beauty inspiring an amoral wonder at the sheer scale and collective will that built it over many years from the accumulated detritus of millions of lives. With laminated passes given to us by one of the colonel's aides, we walk through the gate and down the hill. Truck after truck rumbles by, piled high with household and commercial waste from across Kazan. In the tropical heat, the smell of rot and smoke is everywhere. It seeps into the pores and clings to the back of your throat. Our clothes soak through with sweat. We cut through a maze of narrow alleys filled with uniformed school kids and men playing billiards. Dogs collapsed under the shade of the feltless tables. The neighborhood architecture is cobbled together out of chicken wire, cinder blocks, rusted tin. One rooftop is made entirely out of liberated street signs. Clade leads us down a narrow trail through the jungle, which in places still edges the slum. We walk across a narrow bamboo bridge and up a steep hill where a group of people, mothers with babies, men with arms crossed, sit in the shade of a military-style tent in which a cooking class is underway. 
At the foot of the hill lies a half acre of vegetables, beautifully tended rows of lettuce, tomatoes, carrots, squash, corn. A few people rest under a giant star apple tree by a small creek. A pregnant woman with a little boy works her way down a row of tomato plants, pulling weeds. Tropical butterflies flit about. It would be an utterly rural and bucolic scene if it weren't for the rusty jumble of houses that began at the field's edge, towered over by the gray hill of Piatas. The rumble of the bulldozers and the trucks circling the road up its side is a dull grind, and periodically, a plastic bag caught in an updraft drifts toward us and descends, delicate as a floating dandelion seed into the branches of the trees. We wave the colonel's passes at the guard, a city employee wearing a fluorescent orange t-shirt emblazoned with the word enforcer. On the back, it bears the message, environmentally friendly, in lowercase script. He waves us through after exacting a toll of a couple of cigarettes. On a steep path up the hillside, a line of dusty scavengers finishing their daytime shifts stumble down with bulging plastic sacks on their heads. The smell increases as we climb, a miasma of rotting food and burning tires. But before long, my sense of smell, apparently defeated, ceases to register the full force of the stench. The ground underneath our boots is spongy, and we climb black rib rivulets of leachate flow down the access road. A black puddle releases methane bubbles like a primordial swamp, and the ground itself shakes when a loaded truck rumbles by. A road cut reveals a gray cross-section of oozing agglomerate, shredded plastic bags, the only recognizable remnants in the hyper-compressed pile. The colonel's dreams of a grass-covered return to nature at Piatas seem far off as we ascend through the decades-old strata of the pile. Garbage dumps are far from inert. As rain percolates down through the pile and organic matter decays, a continuous and unpredictable biochemical reaction occurs, leaching toxins from the various plastics, metals, and organic compounds. The slow, smokeless burning of decay is a proce process of centuries. Ancient Roman dumps produce leachate to this day. Newsprint can remain legible for decades. Beneath its surface, Piatas is a roiling and poisonous pressure cooker, and any plan to cover it over with a green mantle will ultimately have to come to terms with what is buried here. Trying hard not to slip back down the rancid surface of the pile, we finally clamber to the top. The highest point in the landscape, the active face of the Piatas stump, is a broad plain of trash extending to a false horizon so that it seems to comprise the entire world. Unlike the gray muck of the mountain's sides, the summit is a riot of torn open, primary colored plastic bags in festive profusion, like a Mardi Gras parade hit on by a cluster bomb. A line of trucks rumbling up the road drops load upon load, which are sifted and pushed to the edges as the hill grows skyward. The quaking geology of trash beneath our feet is laid down layer by layer and covered daily with truckloads of dirt, as Bobby explains, lupa, basura, lupa, basura, earth, garbage, earth, garbage, in sedimentary gradations, building an utterly man-made landscape. Could they be read, the layers at Piatas, like mesolithic middens of oyster shells or the trash heaps of Pompeii, might unravel to a future archaeologist some mystery of the millions of vanished lives whose leavings made this mountain. Hundreds of scavengers brandishing callahigs and sacks, faces covered with filthy t-shirts, eyes peering out like desert nomads through their neck holes, gather in clutches across the dump. Gulls and stray dogs with heavy udders prowl the margins, but the summit is a solely human domain. The impression is of pure entropy. A mass of people as disordered as the refuse itself, swarming frantically over the surface. But patterns emerge, and as trucks dump each new load with a shriek of gears and a sickening glorp of wet garbage, the scavengers surge forward, tearing open plastic bags, spearing cans and plastic bottles with a choreographed efficiency. The intense focus and stooped postures of the Manganga Galahig's bodies recall a post-agricultural version of Millet's gleaners. We stand by the side of a fresh pile and watch as it is worked over with astonishing speed. A callahig slits open a, a bag as if it were a fish, garbage entrails spilling out. And with a series of rapid economical movements, anything useful is speared and flicked into a sack to be sorted later. The ability to discern value at a glimpse, 
to sift the useful out of the rejected with a, as little expenditure of energy as possible is the great talent of the scavenger. I'm very tall and very soft-spoken, um, and I am right now just overwhelmed by uh, Matt's images. They're so they're so visceral that I uh, that I take a deep breath for a second. Uh, it was my privilege to uh, to edit Matt uh, over ten years at uh, three different magazines. He always made it a great experience. I always learned from him. Um, I always felt lucky to um, to have a next assignment to pursue with him. And um, Ted uh, asked me to, to read from um, something I wrote about him, an appreciation. But given that tonight is um, called What Matt Wrote, I'm going to digress. Once to tell a story about when someone really, really didn't like something Matt wrote. And then I'm going to finish on something that we worked on together that uh, was probably the best thing that we did um, while we had our time. So um, here they are. K2 cigarettes Matt brought back from Islamabad as a souvenir and thank you for sending him to Pakistan on no notice. Holding the cigarettes now, I can see Matt's expectant face. He tossed them back softly in my direction and then he waited to get, for me to get a closer look and to greet him back. And of course I laughed, laughed in the embarrassed way you do when you shouldn't be laughing. It was August 2008 and we'd just been discussing his hospital bed interview with one of the few survivors of a climbing disaster on K2, the world's second tallest mountain. We were trying to figure out precisely how the climber's partners had died for an article that I signed Matt from Men's Journal, where I was then the editor. It was a thrilling story, but sad too. And so he broke the grim mood with the official cancer stick of this killing peak. Yesterday I made it seven weeks since I received the gutting news that Matt had died of heat stroke while hiking in Uganda. And like many of his friends, I couldn't believe it, and I, I still can't. Uh, Matt seemed too experienced a traveler to ever become mortally depleted. He had the skill set of a war correspondent, even though he was drawn more to misfits and vulnerable communities than to soldiers in armed conflict. Over the 10 years I knew him, he'd been in the deep in the Amazon, climbed Mount Kenya, and joined a risk-prone eccentric hunting a tree kangaroo on the remote Pacific island of New Britain. Recently, he'd been embedded with Doctors Without Borders in the South Sudan. And together, we'd parse the seemingly minor decisions that can precipitate bad outcomes in the wilderness with those K2 climbers and with Chris McCandless, the idealist who starves to death in John Krakauer's Into the Wild, a book Matt loved and loved to debate. Before he departed for Africa, Matt posted a snapshot on uh, Facebook of a toothbrush and a serrated knife he'd used to cut it in half to save on pack weight. He knew what he was getting himself into. And so I, I want to pause there to share the uh, episode I for, for, foreshadowed there about the time that John Krakauer wrote to, uh, to rip him a new one. And it was about Into the Wild. And Matt had been pestering me for a while. He wanted to go do a story uh, where he's going to hang out with the pilgrims who go to the, the bus where McKenless's body was found. And Alaska ends up being like a foreign assignment and it, it's not a small budget and being an editor watching my budget. I wasn't sure the full story was there. Not sure of my judgment now on that. But anyway, Sean Penn came along to make a movie. And so now we have the dimension that I felt like we were maybe missing for the assignment to go to, um, to Alaska. And he went and he found some people who, who did not sort of fall in with Krakauer's romance. This was an idealist who um, was doing everything right and just had a bad twist of fate, but something of a holy fool. And our cover line was the truth about Into the Wild. And this set Krakauer off. And uh, he wrote a rejoinder, and it was so nasty that his publicist, his publicist's boss, his editor, and his publisher spent the next 12 hours convincing us not to publish what he wrote. And it's really too bad because there was, at the heart of it, there was a great debate that Matt had gotten into on the circumstances of McKinless's death. But this was all about who owned the story. And here's the concluding paragraph of that letter. 
having convinced himself that everyone who writes about McCandless ends up with an elaborate self-portrait no matter what, Matt Power apparently considered it a waste of time to probe the subject with any rigor. His disdainful assessment of McCandless was based on little more than a handful of perfunctory interviews with unsympathetic Alaskans, augmented by conversations with exactly one person who'd actually met the kid. To round out his so-called research, Power spent less than a day in the wilderness where McCandless perished. Power didn't even bother to trek to the bus on foot choosing instead to be driven there in the bitch seat of a six-wheeler, <laughs> making sure that he was back to the hotel in time for dinner. So for the last seven years, bitch seat is all Matt and I have needed to burst out laughing. <clears throat> so I didn't know a thing about Levison Wood. This is the guy that Matt went to um, Uganda to, to profile. But in the aftermath of Matt's death, I knew I disliked him. But for Wood's pointless Nile trek, Matt would still be with us. Eventually, the misplaced outrage subsided, and I looked him up online and quickly determined that Wood is precisely Matt's kind of super tramp, 31-year-old former British Army paratrooper gamely undertaking the unprecedented and completely uncalled for. No one has traced the length of the Nile on foot before, because who walks a river? But this is something that Matt appreciated better than most. The claim of an historic first is merely the excuse, the sponsor-friendly sales pitch for an incredible journey one wishes to make anyway. Under his own power, Wood is moving at an intimate speed, relying on strangers, eating what he can, which was bush rat and peanut sauce, day 95, and surviving on his wits. All things that Matt did as well. So I first met Matt in, um, Manhattan's Bryant Park in 2004, no longer have I been hired for um, as an editor of National Geographic Adventure, where there's several alums here tonight. Uh, he was already a contributor and was eager to do more big stories like the one he'd published on motorcycling a newly opened highway in Kashmir. Matt was doing a fair amount of radio then, though you wouldn't have guessed it right off. He also spoke softly and his voice had a scratch in it. It wasn't nasal, but almost plaintive. He was well built, but not imposing. Reserved at first, but not shy, a tree hugger, all of which I chalked up to his being from Vermont. He was general store friendly. Near as I could tell, he hadn't changed his clothes a stitch since moving to the city. In memory, he's wearing the same corduroy collared army green barn jacket and peering over the top of his wire rims, listening for what's funny and what someone's saying. So right after the Southeast Asian tsunami of, uh, on the, that was December 26, 2004, uh, Matt volunteered to go to Thailand, where at least uh, 5,395 had perished. And before he typed anything up, Matt uh, first did whatever was asked of him on site, including tending to decaying bodies and makeshift morgues, helping families find their loved ones, trying to console survivors, none of which is ever easy, but especially difficult because the, uh, the outsiders who perished there were getting a lot more attention than the locals. <clears throat> and he came back with a moving story, um, but he first, he first he gave of himself. And, um, and that's the story that I was referring to. I went back and reread it just last night, and um, I have a couple paragraphs that I, I, wanna, I wanna share with you. So like the day before, this is Matt now, I fall into line of Thai soldiers, just teenagers in bio suits, really, and we walk to the back of a trailer it's loaded with dry ice, and we form a human chain. A cascade of fog pours out of the trailer from the several tons of dry ice blocks inside, forming a thick blanket on the ground. Two boys with shovels wedge the blocks off and slide them to us. We pass them down the chain, building a wall around 100 bodies laid in rows. The minus 109 degree, 30 pound blocks burn me through the rubber gloves, and I think we might be the first people ever to get frostbite in the tropics. We pass hundreds of blocks. The dry ice sublimates, passes directly from a solid to a gas, and it is beautiful and eerie, the solid vanishing slowly in the air. It makes me think of the transmigration of souls. The Thai boy next to me smiles over his mask. Even without count common language, we seem to understand each other. Just outside the gate at Wat Yen Yao, 
Hamptons where they had the makeshift board. They're serving juice and ice cream. There's a Thai word, Sinuk, that loosely translates to fun. Every task, no matter how arduous, must have some element of Sinuk. Hence, in the work of identifying thousands of dead bodies, there must be ice cream. So, I think Matt was there for a total of eight or 10 days. He left the makeshift morgue after three or four, and he went up to a refugee camp where there were 4,000 people who were near to the coast whose homes were just, just gone. <clears throat> and um, he sat on the beach there at Ba Nam Kem with my back to the ruins, looking out to sea. I half expect the ocean to frighten me, but it doesn't. The water is flat to the horizon, calm beneath the red setting sun. You cannot say traitorous or cruel to speak of it. The ocean offers no reply for all the loss. The only redemptive meaning I've been able to wrest from the tsunami lies instead in the actions of the people who ran in when the water ran out. It's not often I get to turn a mic down after the previous person. I'm Ted Genoways. Uh, I met Matt for the first time at, at Breadloaf um, in the mid-90s and, and uh, worked with him as editor of the Virginia Quarterly Review um, on a few pieces. Um, we also had uh, a lot of fun for a number of summers uh, co-teaching a class that we called Travel Writing 101 at Breadloaf. And for all those years, uh, we would uh, show up there every single time with absolutely no plan and talk through what we had read the previous year that we deeply loved and wanted to talk about and kind of hash it out um, in, in a couple of hours of, of drinks and, and great conversation. Um, I wanted to say following on, on Brad's piece, uh, one of my more potent memories of those times at Breadloaf was uh, right after that McCandless piece had appeared in Men's Journal. And um, I can't now remember if, if Matt had gotten word um, en route to Breadloaf or there at Breadloaf that, that Krakauer had responded. But he knew that the response was gonna be coming in via email. And for those of you who haven't been to Breadloaf, there's a, there's a massive sort of computer lab in, in the basement of the, the small library there. And it was during a reading, so the room was completely abandoned. And we went in there, and he opened up his email, and you could see sort of the, like, the fear of, of the wrath of Krakauer coming down. <laughs> and he sat there reading, reading, reading. And then all of a sudden, this huge smile popped on his face, and he just said, bitch seat. <laughs> and what was great was that he knew then that it was going to be fine, uh, that <laughs> if Krakauer had descended to that level, that, that he had him. Um, so I wanted to read from the, from the, from the piece um, that that Matt wrote about Brad Will called One More Martyr in a Dirty War that was published in VQR in 2007. Um, but what I wanted to, to do for you all was to track a little bit of, of how that piece came about, um, starting with the pitch that Matt sent, much of which ended up in the piece, but um, the way in which it was compressed struck me as telling. So this is from the, the original email to, in November 3rd of 2006. And the email just begins, Hey Ted, a recent tragedy has been much on my mind lately. On October 27th in an alleyway in Santa Lucia del Camino, a grim barrio on the outskirts of Oaxaca, a 36-year-old American journalist named Brad Will was gunned down while filming a demonstration. His camera was running at the moment he was shot. 
the footage, providing not only a horrific first-person perspective of his own death, but preser preserving a fleeting glimpse of his assassins. It's the most disturbing piece of film I've ever seen. He arrived in Oaxaca with an idealist naivete, aware that the situation was extremely tense, but sensing that his status as a gringo with a camera would afford him some sort of protection from the armed gangs of right-wing thugs that frequently sniped at the barricades. His camera was running at the moment he was shot. It, uh, it, sorry, just jumping ahead in the email. Brad was a friend of mine. We met 10 years ago on the Lower East Side of New York when we were both involved in local activism, fighting for the squatted buildings and community gardens of the rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. We were arrested together more than once, spending the night in central booking, telling jokes and stories to help nudge the hour hand along. I was new to, the world, to that world, having just finished school, and Brad, five years older, was a sort of hero and role model, seeming to know everything and everybody. We were both swept up in a sort of revolutionary fervor. Anywhere there was a mass protest, I would see Brad somewhere in the throng, rattling the barriers, running away from the police. We, we rode freight trains together through the Appalachians, dumpster dived in New York, and climbed 250-foot Douglas firs in Oregon to save them from logging. On the morning of September 11th, a few blocks from Ground Zero, just minutes after the towers had collapsed, I ran into Brad in a crowd of thousands, both of us fighting our way against the tide of people to try and help out that morning. He was a recurring presence in my life, so much so that even in death, all his friends expected him to just show back up, laughing about the whole thing. Even as I drifted away from activism the past few years and into more mainstream journalism, we would often see each other. In recent years, he became enamored of popular struggles in Latin America and trying to shift from activism to journalism. I saw him this last summer while on assignment on the Mississippi River for Harper's, running into him on the banks of the river where an anarchism conference was being held. He told me he was going down to Oaxaca, that there was a revolution going on there. He wanted to know more about how to make a living doing journalism and felt that it was his calling. I think Brad romanticized the risks, felt like he would get out of Oaxaca unscathed because he had always gotten out of everywhere unscathed. I'd like to write a piece, part memoir, part essay, about the kind of life Brad lived, about what his death means, about our friendship, and the world we both briefly occupied. Um, Looking at my correspondence, my articulate response to that, which came 15 minutes later, was wow and yes. <laughs> we set a schedule for it um, that was a, a long schedule um, because it was a quarterly magazine. Um, and, and then I promptly, uh, deep into that schedule, had a hole and wrote to Matt asking if he could, if he could suddenly turn the piece around quickly. Um, asking if he, could, if he could write it for me. I wrote to him in April, asking if he could have it for me by the 1st of May instead of in August. His response, greetings from the Galapagos. <laughs> 95 degrees here, had to dodge sea lions to get into this open air internet cafe, drinking watermelon juice. The time is a bit of a crunch. What's the latest I can get it to you and still be able to make the print issue? I return to NYC April 18th. Otherwise, I can do it from this net cafe if I can get them to turn down the salsa music. <laughs> A few weeks later, he, he wrote uh, when I was worried about the likelihood of that coming out. And, and he wrote and said, the piece is growing, going great, very close now. I may give you two versions, one a little more structurally inventive. My roommate, Mark's idea, actually, he's a GQ editor, to have the straight play-by-play -play of the final video dropped in in italics between the background essay sections, have to play around with it and see if it works. Is there time for that? I told him that there was. He delivered it right on time on May 1st. 
And there was one section that he highlighted, um, unsure if it should be included. I want to read the, the section that he was unsure of. As all of you know, this, this, uh, this has to do with, with him writing about uh, by the move of, in the city to, uh, to auction off some, some of the, the, the community gardens. He says, I came up with a scheme to climb a tree in City Hall Park dressed as a sunflower. I'd built the costume for Halloween the previous year, a corona of yellow petals made of satin curtain material stretched over bent coat hangers. The idea was to climb a large ginkgo tree at the corner of the park and not descend until the mayor came out and talked to me. Perhaps unlikely, but given our lack of political clout, it seemed like a good attention-getting plan. I scrambled up into the tree at around 9 a.m. on a Friday morning and sitting on a high branch, put on the sunflower headdress. I sat up there for a while before anyone even noticed. Brad, Brad Will, and I, uh, and the rest of my friends milling around on the sidewalk below. But a policeman finally looked up, and we knew we could count on Giuliani's shock troops to overreact. Within a half hour, a dozen squad cars had pulled up, and the scooter patrol and several vehicles of the city's emergency services unit, including one with a large boat strapped to the roof. I was starting to get nervous, and the thought of a night in central booking alone became less and less appealing. I shouted down to Brad, a veteran of the old growth forest campaigns in the Pacific Northwest. He had much more experience in these sorts of things, asking him what I should do. Well, whenever you come down, they're going to put you through the system, he called up. So you might as well hang out up there for a while and stay free. When the piece was uh, in its absolute final edits and I had sent, you know, that, that set of pages where you say, do not add anything to the draft, there's no time for that. Um, it will repaginate everything. Matt sent back a, a set of small corrections and then one place where he asked if, there was, if it would be possible to make one final addition. And this came, as I say, just in the, in the final days with the note, please add this if there's time and if you think it works. We believed in revolution on all levels. He says, again, speaking of Brad Will. We even kissed each other once in a darkened room at a New York City squat while both of us fumbled with the same girl and our own idealized notions of free love the three of us rolling on a mattress on the floor. There was no electricity save for the filtered streetlight coming through the broken paned window and the noise of the city seemed distant, like waves breaking on a shore. It was one of those hours when the desire to bring justice to the world and the love we held for each other seemed expressions of the same fierce hope. It seemed so innocent and we were intoxicated with that same sense of freedom and possibility. We both certainly broke enough hearts trying to love that way, but I think this was Brad uh, as his purest self, trying to live by Emma Goldman's maxim, if you can't dance, I don't want to be in your revolution. Flawed, utterly human, Brad loved the world and the people in it and tried to share that feeling as best he could. We never talked about that night afterwards, but I always remembered it. So I knew that spot well, the smooth skin just below his ribs, where the perfect bloodless hole appeared. I had rested my head there once. I'm Amy, and I'm reading from the Cherry Tree Garden, which was in Granta in 2008. And just to be clear, there is an Amy in this piece, and I am not that Amy. Um, <laughs> uh, it was hard to, to pick from what to read from this piece because it's, it's a memoir. And um, 
there's so many sort of cherished private moments that he's writing about his own um, feelings and thoughts. And uh, when I was talking with his lifelong friend, uh, Rachel Donatio, today about this piece, she said, you know, I don't think of Matt as the elegiac sort. What struck me most about this piece was how melancholic it was in places. And um, even though it's very much about some of the things you just heard about, his activism, his climbing trees, there's a great moment where he talks about being put in flex cuffs and dragged into a paddy wagon and, and how he was locked up in central booking but had a migraine and it was the most fun he'd ever had. Um, I, I think at least when I read this piece, it makes me feel uh, the feeling that you know not everything lasts. I grew up in the Champlain Valley of Vermont in a drafty old clapboard farmhouse. Through the coldest months, we supplemented oil heat with a cast iron wood stove burning cord after cord of seasoned hardwood. So it's curious that I never learned to split wood or handle an ax until I went to the South Bronx. Our farmhouse was on an apple orchard, a mile deep of Macintosh, Cortland, red delicious northern spies marching in neat rows toward the Adirondacks in the west. Across the road, a meadow subsided into a hardwood swamp running uninterrupted to the banks of Otter Creek, two miles east. Red Loaf Mountain rose above, and by October was often dusted with snow, the first augury of winter. Growing up there was a strange and solitary idol, governed by the moods of seasons and weather and family, the smells of mud and manure and mown hay and wood smoke. Long before my parents divorced, or the house was sold, or the orchard was raised for feed corn, this landscape instilled in me a sense of impermanence. In the summer of 1997, at the age of 22, I washed up in New York City and promptly fell in love with a beautiful and fiercely independent punk girl named Amy with a shaved head and an inextinguishable spark of adventure. She seemed to me to embody all the anarchic joy and freewheeling possibility the city offered the young and broke, a muse of dumpsters and bicycles, game for anything. The city was all strange and all new to be discovered and I followed her down its, all of its rabbit holes. One hot July afternoon, she took me on the sixth train up the length of Manhattan, beneath the mud of the Harlem River, and we climbed at last out into the brightness of Mott Haven, a neighborhood in the southernmost reaches of the Bro South Bronx. We were on 138th Street, with its yellow and red bodega awnings, and in the shade, in their shade, old Dominican men sitting on milk crates, playing dominoes, drinking Colt 45 from paper bags with straws. We rounded a corner, and for the first time, I saw the pre-war apartment building called Casa del Sol rising in the summer shimmer like a mirage. Seen from above, after taking off from LaGuardia Airport, Casa del Sol and its triangular lot surrounded by the flow of traffic heading down the Triborough Bridge appeared as though they were being drawn into a tangled vasculature of the city itself, like a blood clot dislodged from an arterial wall. But if you stood in the shade of the little copse of white birches that grew at the sharpest point of the triangle, with the traffic roaring on the expressway above and the rumbling of buses in the city lot, the building resembled a ship. The garden, its prow, slicing through the sargassum of post-industrial civilization. Early colonizers, milkweed, mullen, sumac, forced their way through the surrounding crumbling concrete sidewalks, out of rooftops and clogged drain spouts and up through piles of tires, Ilanthus altissima, the tree of heaven, less formally known as the ghetto palm, was establishing itself with the astonishing persistence and ingenuity of the illegal immigrant. As the fall progressed and the weather grew colder, I would spend long hours in the small lot behind the building splitting wood. Casa had no electricity, save a single extension cord that ran through the garden and was spliced into the base of a street lamp, pirating enough current to run a few lamps, maybe a computer. For heat, there were several ingenious stoves cobbled out of oil barrels. Harry had put the word out to landscape contractors that we wanted wood. And they were more than happy to oblige rather than to pay to haul to a, a dead tree to the dump. Trucks would back up to a gate in the chain link and unload entire trees cut up into manageable rounds. I had never chopped wood in Vermont, but I fell in love with it in the Bronx. I put together a canvas mailbag of tools, hatchet, axe, maul, splitting wedges, 10 pound sledge, with the precision of a golfer choosing his club. I'd size up each piece and set to work coaxing the wood into stove links. A wedge tapped in the center ring of a slab of birch or pine or black locust, a few more knocks with the sledge to set it, then heft, aim, and swing. The weight of the hammer did the work, driving the steel wedge deep into the wood. Usually I would split wood alone, 
Once, a city bus driver pulled to a stop at the curb, hopped out, and asked if he could have a go at it. If it was cold, breath plumed in the air, the Chrysler building sparkled in the south beyond the highways and bridges, and the work made it warm enough for shirt sleeves. I'd stack piles by the barrel stove, stoke the fires if they needed it, warm twice by the wood. I'd listen to the smoke taking up the chimney pipes that ran out the window to the roof. It was all so simple, but it felt somehow defiant a sort of civil disobedience to ordinary life and the expectations the city imposes on both vocation and avocation. It felt honest. But time finally ran out. The city, which had always owned the tax lien on the building, sold it to an affordable housing group. In December, the police came and evicted everyone at Casa. Bueno was arrested for refusing to leave. That same day, as they sealed up the building, workers hired by the city turned on the long dormant electricity and started a fire. The decades-long scourge of the neighborhood finally came to Casa. And by the time the firemen put it out, the top three floors of the building were gutted and part of the roof had collapsed. The exact cause of the fire, coming so soon after the eviction, was mysterious. I went by Casa del Sol recently to find the building transformed. The brickwork had all been repaired and the long cracks had been sealed. The windows were all replaced and the graffiti and murals blasted away. A security camera pointed at the front entrance. The garden was tended to, but a chain and a lock were on the gate. Has the city changed too much, fallen too far away under the sway of money for anything as strange and, and magical as Casa del Sol to return to existence? Was that time in the South Bronx just a moment in the far ebb of some historical tide when the land was most exposed and we thought we could claim it for our own? Or did those tides of gain and loss, controlled by some unseen economic gravity, pulse back and forth forever? When I contemplate the answers to those questions, I recall riding my bike at sunset in winter over the Willis Avenue Bridge and into the South Bronx. The long dusky light silhouetted the blocks and spires of Manhattan and cast long shadows as I looked down at the Harlem River rail yards. The scene was desolate. Weeds grew up between the sleepers and the staghorn sumac, wove itself through chain link and razor wire. From between a string of rusting boxcars, a mating pair of ring-necked pheasants strutted across the barren rail yard. The two birds were immigrants, an introduced species made wild again by chance and instinct and necessity. They seemed like exiled regents returning to their kingdom. Hi, I'm Christopher Cox. Um, I, uh, when I left the Paris Review for Harper's Magazine, uh, where I became Matt's editor, he sent me a note. Uh, it was very simple. It said, welcome to the somewhat dysfunctional and always entertaining family. Um, and uh, working with Matt at Harper's uh, was very much like, uh, like being in a family. Um, we only had the chance to finish one piece together um, but uh, that piece was, was brought into the world on the back of uh, a lot of cocktails at Charlene's and lunches in NoHo and visits to Jess's house uh, and consultations in my garden. I mean, it, uh, it was, I'd known Matt for many years, but it was really through working with him that he became my friend. Um, so I'm going to read from that piece tonight. Um, it's an essay called Slipping Through the Net, Cambodia's Border War Against Drug-Resistant Malaria. Um, I'll mention as, a, as an aside, since so many of these pieces are um, uh, from all over the world, uh, the, uh, Matt had an assignment with us. His latest assignment was going to be reported from the office parks of Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm, I'm sure it would have been amazing. Um, so for this piece, Slipping Through the Net, uh, Matt went to the Cambodia-Thai border where the World Health Organization was trying to contain an outbreak of drug-resistant malaria. Uh, for the past decade, the most successful treatment for malaria and for the m deadliest strain of malaria uh, has been something called uh, artemisinin combination therapy. Uh, artemisinin has saved thousands of lives, but in 2010, um, a small number of patients near this town in Cambodia called Pai Lin uh, stopped responding to the drug. Uh, the WHO was there to stop the resistant strain of the disease from spreading into Thailand and from there into the rest of the world. Uh, it was an important public health story, but one that ran the risk of maybe seeming a little bit dry. 
uh, but not, as it turned out, in Matt's pow Matt Power's hands. Um, this section that I'm going to read comes from about halfway through the piece. To see the containment plan in action, I join a drug inspector named Nuth Tith on his morning rounds. Tith is one of a phalanx of inspectors visiting pharmacies throughout the region to search for fake or ineffectual mal malaria medication. He's especially concerned with stopping monotherapy, the sale of artemisinin without its partner drugs, a practice that greatly increases the chances of resistance evolving. Tith, compact, middle-aged, with large glasses, and the strict demeanor of a school teacher, is dapper in his inspector's uniform. High waist, epaulets, and a sky-blue peat cap with an enormous golden crest. Like many government employees in the region, He's a former member of the Khmer Rouge. We get into a shiny white Toyota Land Cruiser, the official vehicle of NGO Land, which bears the emblem of the World Health Organization. Following us is a convoy of several matching SUVs carrying doctors and officials from the British nonprofit Malaria Consortium and the National Malaria Center. The logo for the latter is a giant blood engorged mosquito inserting its proboscis into a map of Cambodia. It occurs to me that by pulling up in a convoy of white aid vehicles filled with government health officials, foreign aid workers, and a journalist, we may be foregoing the element of surprise. We come to a long row of drugstores at the edge of the market in Pailin. At the first shop, a blue cross hangs from an awning and a glass case displays sun-bleached boxes of medicine. Tith smiles and chats with the proprietor, an older woman who opens up a ledger for his perusal and he strolls around the shop, glancing into the cases piled high with antibiotics, painkillers, and other prescription drugs. There are shops like this in every village, mainly purchasing their supplies from traveling drug sellers. It is an incredibly difficult system to police in a country like Cambodia, where market pressures combine with high levels of government corruption to hinder enforcement. Tith, however, looks incorruptibly serious, a ramrod straight and unsmiling martinet as he conducts his duties. Throughout the dark drug shops, it is clear that the inspector is a familiar presence, and Tith goes through the same routine at each, the sellers showing their wares and opening their books, the inspector checking dutifully that the drugs are above board. But it is also clear that the system has its limits. To see the real situation in drugstores, Tith says, you need a mystery client, someone who can go incognito and try to purchase black market malaria drugs. The problem of fake anti-malarials has been widespread in Asia for more than a decade. In 2006, investigators from WHO and Interpol tested 391 samples of anti-malarials gathered from across Southeast Asia. Operation Jupiter, it was, as it was called, found that half the samples were fakes. Some pills contained acetaminophen or the useless anti-malarial chloroquine. Others contained toxic precursors of the club drug ecstasy suggesting that the manufacturers thought fake anti-malarials might have a comparable profit margin. But perhaps the gravest threat posed by fakes was that many samples actually did contain traces of artemisinin, possibly included to throw off testing. One of the surest ways to breed resistance to, to a malaria drug is to expose the parasite pool to an insufficient dose, creating what is known as drug pressure. The WHO learned this in the 1960s when its disastrous program of adding chloroquine to table salt ushered in the drug's failure worldwide. Tith and I and the rest make our way back to our vehicles through the throat-clogging air of the meat market, where catfish lie on blocks of ice and live eels royal in buckets. Unidentifiable bush meat sits next to bloody mounds of offal. Broad trays offer spiced and deep-fried regional delicacies for sale by the kilo. Frogs, crickets, grasshoppers, water bugs, mealworms, tarantulas. The floor is swarming with two-inch cockroaches, their antennae whipping robotically. Then I realize they are everywhere, even dropping down from the canvas tarp overhead. One falls straight down the back of my collar and skitters between my shoulder blades as I dance around frantically trying to shake the thing out. I feel a hand dart up my shirt, and with a quick pinch, the cockroach is plucked off my bare skin. Tith flicks it away casually as he gives me an apologetic smile. The shopkeepers explode into laughter. Thank you.
Hello. <clears throat> My name is Mike Benoit, and I was uh, met Matt at National Geographic Adventure Magazine. There are a few of us, and um, became his editor at GQ. Um, was <laughs> Matt, when he pitched um, the idea uh, that I'm going to read from tonight, um, knew that the idea of uh, urban exploration wasn't necessarily new. The, <laughs> the first issue of National Geographic Adventure had a story on urban exploration of Minnesota, I think, in like 1999. But what Matt did with the story and what he did with all of his stories was um, surprise. And one of the ways he did it was he found this guy, Bradley Garrett, who was um, a, he was, he did his doctoral research on place hacking. And um, as Matt describes it, the title came from his, and the, his argument that physical space is coded just like the operating system of a computer network. It could be hacked, explored, infiltrated, recoded in precisely the same ways. Um, so any sort of doubts I had about whether it would feel new or exciting or whatever were answered pretty quickly when Matt And he is perched on a, the, one of the gargoyles at the Chrysler building. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read from two little different areas of the, of the piece. Um, the following midnight, I found myself following Explo's command of action, climbing, him, climbing after him over a construction fence surrounding a half-built office tower in La Defense, the central business district of Paris. We found the main stairwell and humped 38 stories up, legs burning and gasping for breath. The building, designed by the American art architect, Robert A.M. Stern, had the unimprovable name Carpe Diem. We came out onto the darkened concrete roof and then scaled the metal stairs of a looming tower crane, sweat freezing in the now alpine air. In the sharp wind, the crane swiveled side to side like a giant weather vane. Paris flowed and pulsed 600 feet below us, but it was eerily, eerily quiet at that height. In the distance, the Eiffel Tower erupted into a glittering laser light spectacle to mark the hour. Several, peop several people crammed into the operating ca operator's cabin of the crane, which, quelle surprise, had still had the keys in it. Someone scrolled through the crane's commands on its touchscreen. I asked them to stop touching the fucking buttons, please. <laughs> Exiting the building site after the long walk down, Explo whispered in a mock video game voice, level two complete. It occurred to me then that Explo's cry of action at the beginning of each adventure had a double meaning. It was both a call to arms and a director's command in the fantasy movie of his own life, in which he was the auteur and hero both. The urbex life is at its heart a form of play, a pressure valve to regulate the atmospheric crush of daily life. Explo at his programming job, my daydream of a manhole in the floor of his cubicle of some escape from the mundane requirements of modern society. Once you begin playing this game, the entire world becomes filled with secret doors. So this is, um, <coughs> this next chunk is just as, um, it's just the <laughs> definitely the climax of the piece. Um, so at the stroke of one, the spotlights that bathed Notre Dame Cathedral and a noontime glare were finally flipped off and a group of singing, dr singing drunks gathered around the left bank brought out their congas. This provided excellent cover as Explo, Helen, Otter, and I crossed the Pont Saint-Louis and clambered around a corona of iron spikes 40 feet above the Seine. We crossed a shaded park and scaled another spike fence, careful not to sma snag backpacks heavy with camera equipment and enough mountaineering gear to assault the Matterhorn. We spoke in whispers as we pulled on climbing harnesses and looked up through the darkness at the soaring Gothic buttresses and pinnacles of the irreplaceable monument of world heritage we were about to climb. I felt a twinge of conscience, or rather, something more than a twinge. They warn you in journalism school, or so I'm told, about the risks of going too deep with subjects of your work, of, lo of losing grasp of the dispassionate objectivity necessary to report a balanced story. G Bradley Garrett, had already dealt with this ethical quicksand by surfing gleefully across it, unashamed of his decision to, quote, become a part of the culture under study, as he put it. 
I stood, stood before the same quagmire. It wasn't really about breaking the law, as I'd already done that many times over on two different, in two different countries. Standing there at the base of the 850-year-old cathedral, I felt conflicted between my deep desire to climb it and my equal, equally deep desire not to be splashed across the French tabloids, not to mention the French flagstones, as an idiot American who snapped off a gargoyle before plunging to his doom. I should say, I'm going to stop just for a moment, this was the exact part of the story where, which Jess um, objected to the most, so she is, her objections are noted. Um, <laughs> but Explo was already halfway up, and, as soon, and he soon anchored a climbing line to belay us from above. I met the tide of action, I let the tide of action bear me along, and started up the rope using special splunking ascenders attached to my harness. I promised Expo to omit a few salient details about our route from this narrative. Suffice it to say, nothing was harmed in the climb. But the intimacy with the building was startling. I passed so closely by a gar carved gargoyle, I could see the furrows of its brow, could almost smell its breath. Atop the first roof, we found ourselves in a long gallery of flying buttresses, which spanned outward like the landing struts of some alien spacecraft. Each buttress framed a 50-foot arch stained glass window darkened from within. And as we climbed to the next level, I pulled myself up next to one. I spun slowly on the rope, and for a heart-stopping instant, my shoulder rested gently against the glass. I was so close, I could see the seams of lead that connected the thousands of pieces of colored glass, the end result of centuries of labor at the hands of nameless artisans. I felt in that moment I would rather fall than damage it. Three hours and three pitches brought us to the peak of the south transept, 180 feet above the scent, which flowed past inkly as the drunk still drummed on the far side. My hands were black from the lead roof tiles. Carved saints and angels and a demonic bestiary of gargoyles peered from every nook, and the central steeple pierced the night sky. I'm not a believer at all, but I felt something akin to what I'd always imagined to be the intended reaction of a great cathedral, some visceral mix of awe and fear. Across the bell towers, you could see the corral viewing platform where the public is actually allowed. No doubt it's great. But as the urbex ethos has it, buying a ticket and obediently going where, the way you're told is the exact opposite of the point. So there we were at 4 a.m., witness to a sublimity almost no one else would ever know. As it happened, the French resistance had rung the cathedral's, bell, cathedral's bells this very night in 1944 to signal the liberation of Paris. It was not the same scale of freedom, of course, but it sufficed. It was almost dawn, and we repelled down the way we'd come scaling the fences and dropping back out to the street. When we returned to the car, Explo asked Helen for the key car keys. She was quite certain she had given them to him. He was quite sure, certain she had not. Frantic searching of bags commenced as the sky lightened. Finally, Explo ran back, scaling the fences again to hunt for the keys where they had fallen from Helen's pocket and off the roof of the cathedral. Small miracle, he found them. We pulled over at, at a truck stop on the outskirts of Paris, standing in line behind the bleary-eyed and glum denizens of the morning shift. Helen surveyed the scene in dismay. None of these people know where we were two hours ago. You just go back to normal life and it sucks. I met Sister Elizabeth. I wanted to just talk just for a few minutes about the award um, that we're setting up to give you a little more information on that. Um, and I wanted to start by sharing actually one of the, a brief section of a tribute um, that in some ways kind of is the, the um, under, undercurrent to why we wanted to, to establish this. Among the many wonderful tributes that were written about Matt in these past few weeks um, was a touching blog post written by Justin Noble. And he acknowledged right up front that he didn't know Matthew. Um, he didn't have a personal relationship as many of those who are here today and many of the editors and friends really had established. Um, but he credited Matt as being his inspiration. Justin wrote, I found Matthew's writing as a young man my pockets stuffed with scrawled-up notebooks, 
my mind addled by how to turn the scrawl into that thing called writing, that thing I could do for a magazine or a newsletter or a pamphlet or anything really. I wanted to scrap, scrape together a living and a life with nothing more than a pen and a pad and a burning desire to make journeys. Matt was notorious for motivating aspiring young writers, providing them with counsel, encouragement, and connections. He wanted others to live their dream, pursuing stories that mattered. And he wanted these writers to realize, as Justin wrote, the way to do it was to just do it. And um, as we thought in these past few weeks, really I think in a way to um, find something constructive to do um, during our grief and shock, to find a way to pay tribute to what Matthew lived, what he wanted to accomplish, um, and what he saw in so many of his fellow writers, which was this passion for writing. Uh, I've been incredibly privileged um, to work with Ted, thank you, and, and Jess, um, Roger, um, Brad, and, and so many others, and, and the administration and team here at um, the Arthur Carter Journalism Institute. Uh, to really envi envision this legacy tribute for Matthew. Uh, the idea is that the Matthew Power Literary Reporting Award will support promising writers early in their careers with support for their work, for their travel, for the reporting, for the pursuit of the story. To provide them um, the opportunity to write and to live that dream. Recipients will be selected annually through a national competition and a selection committee will um, serve um, as a panel, both of faculty here at NYU led by Ted Conover and also among the, the writing community um, of writers and editors. Um, with really the, the, the goal of supporting and encouraging the selected writer um, to pursue a story that was similar to some of the stories we've heard here tonight that characterized Matt's work that brought the world to us um, and brings the world to us so that future generations of writers will bring those untold stories of the human condition um, to us, to us in our living rooms where we might be cozy out from the rain, <laughs> um, away from where, where this might be happening, but bringing it to our minds and, and to our experience. So I really just wanted to say thank you tonight on behalf of my family and behalf of Jess and um, for the time of the readers here today, but also the effort um, uh, within the community to help us honor Matthew with this award, um, to spread the word about it, um, and also to encourage people to apply, um, to be selected, to, to, to pursue their, their craft and their dream, um, and have a chance to tell the stories that we want to keep hearing um, in Matthew's uh, memory and in his honor. So I just want to say thank you. One of the few uh, upsides of the last few weeks has been the opportunity to hug so many fantastic people. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, the, the sound of uh, pounding you sometimes hear from back there is rain on the roof, which uh, my weather app said would be done by now. Um, but maybe in another five minutes, uh, it will be finished. I wanted to, uh, to end tonight with a, a very brief reading from my favorite piece of Matthews, which is called Mississippi Drift. Uh, in the summer of 2006, I was back in Vermont and got a call from Matt, who was in Minnesota. He described a journey he'd just been on and was kind of still on, an anarchist expedition to float down the Mississippi River, led by a sort of punk Captain Ahab named Matt Bullard. Matt Power had met Matt Bullard seven years before in a park in Arcata. Is that how you say it? Arcata, California? A-R-C-A-T-A? -A -A? Arcata, thank you. As he later wrote in Harper's, Matt was almost exactly my age, and from that first time we talked, I admired his raconturial zest and scammer's panache. 
he considered shoplifting a political act and dumpstering a civil right. Matt Power <coughs> had accepted Matt Bullard's invitation to join a group, join the group, and had spent many days with them. I was excited. It sounds like a book, I, I, told, I told him. Matt wasn't so sure. The raft was moving extremely slowly, about seven miles a day, with 1,500 miles to go. <laughs> he would later write, worse, Bullard was impossible to get along with and the crew was gradually abandoning him. <laughs> I think I like this in part because it's so delightfully unlikely, so anti-National Geographic, and also because to me the role of a punk Huck Finn suited Matt so perfectly. So here's uh, three paragraphs. To inaugurate the voyage, Matt, this is Matt Bullard, had planned a launch party a mile downstream at a beach on the river's edge. And I think we heard about the same party, Ted, uh, in your reading. With a few more arrivals, our little crew swelled to five. Me and Matt, plus Cody Dornbush, a compact, bearded 24-year-old from South Dakota, Chris Broderdorp, a 21-year-old bicyclist and master dumpster diver from Minneapolis, rail thin with a half-shaved mop of curls and a high-pitched laugh, and Christina Brown, a fetching, level-headed 25-year-old from Seattle who among them had the most schooling and seemed most to be play-acting at the pirate life. I was the only crew member without a pierced septum. <laughs> Matt seldom distances himself from his subjects like that, but, <laughs> but there it is. The general mood among my boatmates was upbeat. The overflowing dumpsters of middle America would be more than enough to sustain our bodies, and adventure would nourish our spirits. Matt fired up the ancient engine, and in a haze of blue exhaust smoke, we chugged slowly out into the current, which had the color and foaminess of Coca-Cola, and headed downstream, hidden from the city by the limestone bluffs. The abandoned mills around Falls of Saint, the Falls of St. Anthony the falls that had brought the city here, had been converted into million-dollar condominiums. The Minneapolis-St. Paul Metroplex, tidy and forward-looking, seemed to have turned its back on the river that birthed it. The party, advertised among the local punk scene through word of mouth and printed flyers, commenced at sundown. The raft was hung with Christmas lights, and a driftwood bonfire blazed on the sand. Kids drank 40s of malt liquor and climbed over and over again onto the roof of the raft, jumping, diving, and cannonballing in various states of undress into the muddy brown river water. The night was humid and sultry, tinged with menace, and a thick darkness pressed down upon the river. Amid all the wild shouting and splashing, the dirt smudged, faces lit up by flames and colored Christmas lights, it seemed as though the raft had run aground on some cargo cult's island, the natives working themselves into a frenzy as they decided whether to worship us or eat us or escort us to the edge of the volcano at Spear Point. At one point, someone stumbled in into me in the dark, dripping, and grabbed me by the shirt, smelling of sweat and booze and the river. His voice slurred, Hey, you're the writer from New York. I reluctantly confirmed this. Well, your fucking story better be about solutions. <laughs> he dragged the word out for emphasis. Otherwise, it's bullshit. <laughs> solutions. His grip tightened. <laughs> he attempted to fix his gaze to mine and failed. He shouted, solutions, one more, <laughs> once more for good measure before shambling away and jumping into the river again. In the morning, with the ashes of the bonfire still smoldering and a half dozen half-dressed casualties of the Bacchanal sprawled out on the beach, we pulled the lines in and pushed the raft's barrels off the sandbar, drifting out and spinning like a compass needle until the boat nosed at long last into the flow of the river. 
with the Lyndon Johnson, the nickname I'd given the 40-year-old engine. At half throttle, the raft meandered with the current, the green wall of trees slipping by at walking pace. <laughs> the five-gallon gas tank was draining disturbingly fast. I sat on the front porch swing, rereading a dog-eared newspaper. Chris idly strummed a guitar as Cody, Matt, and Christina sat up top, steering from the captain's chair. You know, you're going to be reading that fucking July 16th New York Times for the next month, Cody told me, sticking his head over the edge. I put the paper down. A Hmong family fished from a railroad embankment, waving excitedly as we passed, perhaps remembering the long tail boats of their far off Mekong. Eagles wheeled and dove into the river, which unscrolled before us as we rounded each bend. It was high summer, blue skies and sunny, about as auspicious as one could hope for the start of a 2,000-mile journey. We'd hung up ragged pirate flags, and now they fluttered behind us in the breeze. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for celebrating, Matt. Um, think of making a donation to the fund, and we will... Uh, work to keep this spirit alive. Thanks. <laughs>